welcome back to Think Tech for the five o'clock block. We have Think Tech Tech Talks with Ethan Allen, who is, is on our wall for memorial, <clears throat> memorable service uh, uh, over the years, commendable service over the years as a host here on Think Tech. And uh, he's our chief scientist. It really is a good thing to have. A, everybody should have a chief scientist. Thank you so much, Ethan, to be here. Thanks for having me back, Jay. It's a pleasure to be back and talking with you, as always. So we're talking today about some of the remarkable advances, discoveries, inventions, amazing things um, that have come out of Israel recently. It's, and it's all sparked by a, a few uh, newspaper articles just listing all these incredible things they have done in information technology, medical technology, all altruistic contributions you know, to, to humanity. Uh, it's very interesting, and I know you've studied it, and I, I wonder if we could get a handle on you know, what it is, what they're focusing on, and why. So, I mean, a lot of what I saw, and again, I, I've just, I haven't dug into this deeply, but a lot of what, what I saw based on the uh, leads you gave me were medical issues that are serious medical problems affecting people all around the world. And they were coming up with good practical solutions that, that are, wildly innovative and yet uh, should make the treatment of, of these uh, conditions much more readily available, much more widely available to many more people. And, and as such, it's you know really admirable science, uh, tr truly amazing stuff. Well, you know, just a footnote on that to say that, you know, up till the time of COVID, at least in my imperfect view of the world, I, I figured that the United States was the leader in, in science, a leader. Mm -hmm. And we had more uh, healthcare science and we had more information technology than anyone else by leaps and bounds. And, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people who still say that, I still feel that way. But if you look around over the past year, say, you begin wondering, um, you know, what's going on? For example, um, China has a lot of technology, they have a different way of doing it. And sometimes they secrete it. Sometimes they rip it off, but they have it, and they have scientists, many of whom were trained in this country, um, you know, that are world class. So they're directly competing with us to be leader in science and technology. I was telling you before the show that there's a, uh, a, a therapeutic that was announced in the paper uh, by by a group um, in British Columbia, which is a, um, a therapeutic, uh, a nasal spray called Sanotas. Um, and it, it, it knocks off COVID. If you have COVID symptoms, this will knock off the disease in like one day and with very high rate of success, like almost 100%. So, you know, this is quite remarkable. That's Canada. That's not the U.S. Right. And then you, you talk about the Pfizer drug. The Pfizer drug was developed by a couple of Turks who were doing research in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's not really an American discovery at all. And, and, and so what we have is the science has permeated the globe. I mean, even Russia, you know, has for their, well, their troubles and everything, uh, they, they have, um, uh, you know, a vaccine. Uh, so many vaccines, not all, not all from the U.S. And then, of course, now Israel. It's very innovative. We knew they were innovative. You know, I, I remember, it's, it's just, I'll stop in a minute here. I remember. You know, they were buying these fighter planes from us. And, um, and the problem with the fighter planes that were then being manufactured is that the pilot could not see behind him in a dogfight. He couldn't see it. So the Israelis bought some rearview mirrors from an auto supply store <laughs> and to put them in a the cockpit. And now the fighter pilot could look in the, in the rearview mirror and see what was behind him. Right. I mean, it's brilliant. Yeah. And, and then the American manufacturers adopted exactly the same system. Sure, sure. You know, you always copy the good ideas, you know, absolutely. Yeah. You know. yeah. So it's about innovation, you know, and I think innovation is around the world. Science, technology is... You know, you can no longer feel that we have a lock on these things. And it travels. It, you know, yep. Everybody copies everybody else. And, and science, as you know, is a completely collaborative global industry. So it could happen pretty much anywhere. So mm -hmm. 
the Israelis, though, they are impressive. So can you talk about some of the things they've, they've found these days? Sure. So, so one of the first things I read about there was this, um, essentially, you're just speaking of a, a nasal spray for Alzheimer's disease. And it's, I guess, still undergoing tests, but it looks like not only can it, uh, it, it can not only perhaps prevent, delay or prevent Alzheimer's, but may even actually be able to reverse some of the symptoms of it in, in cases that are already there. Uh, tricky chemical gets past, past the blood brain barrier, gets in and starts chewing away at the plaques in the brain that are thought to be associated with Alzheimer's and just sort of dissolves those away. Um, amazing stuff, you know, the, the fact that it can be delivered as a nasal spray means essentially it's going to be very easy to distribute it. Um, you know, people will be able to self-administer it. You won't need to go visit a hospital to, to get this treatment. Uh, presumably it's going to be uh, shelf stable and maybe require refrigeration. I, I didn't get that part of it, may not, you know, but it won't need anything super spiffy in terms of uh, care, in terms of a special low, super low temperature or anything. Doesn't need any fancy equipment to administer it, you know? Uh, remarkable. And, and, no. and Alzheimer's is it's such a huge problem in this country, around, around the world. Around this world, I mean, we've got so huge numbers of people wind up developing Alzheimer's. Huge. We've got yeah, we've got an aging population in, in a lot of the the Western world as well as a lot of Asia. China actually has a huge aging population right now um, that they they're going to have to deal with. But so do we. So Japan, of course, does classically. Yeah. So this this was really an amazing an amazing technology. Um, you know. What I find what I find extraordinary is the, is the thing about delivery system. You know, if you want to be invasive and and do brain surgery and take take top of his head off, um, I suppose you can do stuff, but there's all kinds of penalties to pay on that one. Right. Um, once you figure it out that the you know the end of the sinus there is very close to the brain, and and you can uh, have the brain absorb whatever is in that spray. Right. And, and thus fix the problem, the plaque, right? right. It's, it, Alzheimer's is about plaque. Um, that's, that's like a miracle. miracle. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. you can do this at home. This is going to change the whole world of Alzheimer's. Yeah. I know people whose, whose spouses have died from Alzheimer's. They, they could be alive today with this drug. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see how, you know, how soon it can get approval. Uh, get make it out at least into the widespread trials. Um, I mean, it is it is interesting to go back to a point you raised earlier. The U.S. was was right was right widely regarded as being the best prepared country in the world for a pandemic. Um, and but in 2019, they'd actually done a, a worldwide survey and, and this medical preparation group basically, and, and they rated the U.S. really head and shoulders above anyone else. We were the best prepared to handle it. And, you know, it, it goes to either they were looking at the wrong criteria or other people are much more adaptable than we are, <laughs> you know, because um, yeah. other groups certainly handle it better. But, but um, again, a, another thing that, that uh, I looked at, that they got now uh, a, a blood test for detecting colon cancer. I, I mean, again, uh, similar to Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, you can't really detect except by symptoms or after death, really, you can go and dig out the brain. Colon cancer, the traditional way to find it has been, you know, rather nasty invasive uh, colonoscopy, you know, which any of us of a certain age know are no fun at all. Um, they're expensive, they're time consuming, they take a fair amount of medical personnel, you have to do them at least in a, you know, a medical facility of some sort. Yeah, and uh, and they, they have a certain amount of risk. Right, yeah, absolutely. Uh, perforation of colon that can happen and you know various different things a blood test much simpler you know again they've, they've taken that they just took down a whole bunch uh, you know i again i don't know how much blood i don't know how sensitive the test is it's, it's reputed to be quite good um but again depending on how this is it could be something again that could be self-administered if it just really takes a finger prick of blood if it takes a little more blood you're probably going to have to go to a doctor's office and get them to draw some blood but you know Again, it could be checked for then as part of routine annual blood work. 
you know, and be just one more add on test, just click it, you know, check, check this box and, you know, they check your blood for uh, pre-symptomatic colon cancer. And they, they can find it earlier in some cases than the, the biopsies can, you know? Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and some, I think something like half a million people uh, in the United States die from colon cancer every year because they don't catch it. This, yeah. this would be uh, easy to catch and uh, it would, would save a lot of lives. Exactly. I mean, there's something, there's a lot of people who simply because they don't want to go through the hassle of a colonoscopy, they won't, they just won't go get a check. They, they either from embarrassment, from self-consciousness, from lack of time, being too busy, uh, from the fact that it isn't really a pleasant procedure, uh, you know, the preparation is no fun and, and the actual procedure itself is even less so. But uh, it, instead, you just, you know, have a part of your yearly blood work that, that right. most people try to get done, you know. Um, right. All automated. And, yeah. and, that mean, and that means cheap. And yes. if, if you have to go in for a colonoscopy and, and go under uh, anesthesia and yeah. kill a half a day with all these, you know, doctors and nurses around you, that's going to cost a lot of money for yeah. somebody. Whether it's the insurance company or you, it's going to cost a lot of money. This, all this money would be saved. Right. And, and similarly, they've now apparently developed a, a screening test for lung cancer based on your breath. Based on, since you just have to breathe out into this device, and it can detect the DNA, mutated DNA that is very likely and very highly associated with uh, cancerous cells. And it, again, this kind of stuff builds on, and none of this stuff springs de novo, right? It, it all builds on other technologies. People have gotten this DNA sequencing technology really that's developed very rapidly over the past decade, better and better and better. So they can do it smaller, faster, more accurately. And now they've come up with, and lung cancer, again, to, to, for a diagnosis before, typically people would wait until they get symptoms. You go in, you get at least, you know, basically an x-ray for it, you know, spots show up or they don't show up. You know, it, it's something of a hassle. It's certainly you're exposing yourself to radiation risk uh, from an x-ray, which is needless. Um, you know, there's a, and a lot of people don't get tested. You know, they ignore the symptoms. Right. And and it winds up killing them. Yeah. yeah. And again, if something like this pans out well, now they point out it's very tricky because your breath is a, you know, a, a chemical stew, basically. And depending on what you've been doing before you breathe out, impacts your breath very heavily, right? If you're in a, if you're in a smoke-filled room or if you've just been eating or drinking or whatever, all that is going to be reflected back in your breath. <clears throat> so uh, I'm sure there's still some, you know, things to work out with, with this. But again, it's going to make the test so much easier, so much more broadly accessible that people will take it. They'll, hey, sure, it's worth it. You know, all you have to do is blow in a tube and, you know, 20 minutes later, you have, you have some result. Uh, and if you know cancer or friends in your family or something, I mean, suddenly it's like, hey, I'll do one of those tests every six months. I'll do one every three months, you know, whatever. You know, no fuss, no muss. It's, I would... it's not invasive at all. Right. Zero. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, this is it's like before we're talking about the delivery system with the nasal sprays. Um, in this case, uh, it's, it's sort of the reverse of that. <clears throat> you're just, you're, you're waiting for the body to deliver its message to you. And you have to be listening. You know? Yeah, you know it's very interesting. I I don't know if you if you read there are people have figured out there are dogs who know how who essentially smell cancer basically in people, uh, and who are who are very good and very accurate. So this is it in a way it's a very logical development, right? They they have figured out probably dogs are probably smelling something very similar to what this device is actually detecting is some you know mutated uh, DNA. Uh, but it, it's, it's just intriguing. But again, yes, that, that, that beautiful combination of here's a big problem, a common problem, and look, this piece of it, suddenly the diagnosis of it, we can just cut through a lot of the crap and make it really simple, really easy, and cheap. You know? and so we're going to spread this technology around the world. You know? and probably 10 years from now, it'll be you know, something that everyone does. Oh, I would want it. What's the risk? There is no risk at all. Yeah. Zero. And Exactly. I mean, the worst it could do is give a false positive, and you, it seems like you just take another test and it's a negative, and then you say, well, the third one, and best out of three, we'll call it good. 
um, well, I take your point about the dogs. I was thinking the same thought when you were describing this. You know, <clears throat> smells can tell you a lot. Uh, my wife and I are watching this serial called uh, Body of Proof. It's about a medical, medical examiner. Not that it's authoritative on medicine, but there's a lot of medicine to learn from it. And it's about a medical examiner in, in Philadelphia. And she, she's, she's always smelling um, the dead bodies because it can tell her so much. And she has trained herself to smell for things, just like the dogs. Yeah. And so if you say that smell can tell you things about the body, it's not just lung cancer. It's, oh, no. It could be no. a lot of other things. There, there are dogs who picked up on local tumors. That is, you know, uh, I was reading about a case where this guy, his dog suddenly started paying a lot of attention to a spot on his left leg, you know, and we just sit there with his nose sort of pressed against this spot, you know. Out of the clear blue sky, he was doing this, and it turned out he had he had a tumor in right right wow. under when that dog was sniffing, basically. Uh, uh, you know, wow, that is so uh, interesting. Yeah. But if the dog can do it, and right. if we have found a way to do the biochemical analysis with with breath and lung cancer, then mm -hmm. we can do better than dogs on on the leg as well. We, we can use it. the same technology and just convert it to other diseases and conditions. Right. That's yeah. That's that's one of the one of the things that came out um, of this. Yeah, it's a nice example, right? This is a, should be a broadly applicable technology that you could take to stomach cancer, bladder cancer, colon cancer, whatever. You know, all the, maybe you could even start spotting some of the really hard ones like ovarian cancer, which you know, typically isn't spotted until stage four, right? And uh, and it's essentially untreatable. Um, if you could do that. You know, again, it, it, be saving huge numbers of lives. But it put me to mind one of the other uh, pieces I read about. They have developed, again, the, the Israeli scientists have developed this beautiful device that basically, uh, it's on the nano scale, you know, since the molecular scale, and it it's a it's a decoy for viruses, and apparently you can build it for any class of virus you want, and you put this in and the viruses go and sort of attack this thing rather than your own cells. And so uh, you get, uh, you have a, a far lower viral load ultimately in, in your body because they're all falling into this trap basically that, that sort of eats them and destroys them. <laughs> it's, it's, a mouse trap. it's a mouse trap. That's right, right. It's a mouse trap for very small mice. <laughs> um, again, you know, once, once you've got it, you know, who, who knows? I mean, there are a lot of viral diseases around, right? And who knows how many of them will be able to ultimately apply it to? It's, it's a truly amazing technology, you know? Well, all of these things, you know, can be extended. I mean, for example, I was just thinking that the whole notion of the, the smell, <clears throat> uh, the biochemical analysis of, of air coming out of your mouth, you know, what about biochemical analysis in, in, a, in a new way using AI, what have you? For, for urine or feces, uh, mm -hmm. you can really learn a lot about how somebody's body is performing without any invasive procedure at right. all. And, and or sweat, you know? Sweat, there you go, the skin. Yeah. This is out of Star Trek, it really right. is. Oh, I, yeah, I can, I can believe that sometime, you know, not far it is in the future, you'll have, you know, you can stick a little pad on your arm for five minutes. And yeah, it'll do a whole analysis for a whole bunch of different diseases including cancers of various sorts, metabolic conditions, you know. Uh, you know. And the mousetrap, you know, right. as we have followed the science, I mean, to the, it's imperfect because we haven't been told enough to really, you know, become about <clears throat> amateur scientists over the, over the past year. We've learned some things about viruses, but not enough. One of the things that has come up is, wait a minute, so, you know, we had SARS and we've had, mm, What's the one in the Middle Mer East? MERS. MERS. Yeah. And, you know, we've had Ebola. Ebola is a virus, too, isn't it? Yes. Um, and, you know, these, each one of these things is, is its own killer. Um, and, you know, you can solve one of them, but not others. And we, we haven't come up with a universal virus killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, that has got, that's got to be down the line because... Because of these variants, you know, the viruses will mutate 
and then we have to develop another vaccine, and that's a whole different experience. And you know, <clears throat> we may not be that good that we could follow it quick enough. You know? This was pretty good over the course of a year, but there'll be more. You, we live no. in a world of mutating viruses, oh, and the more uh, cases, the more mutate. Anyway, it seems to me the mousetrap thing. Yeah, I mean, that, that's universal. It's universal. Yeah. Right, that should be should be adaptable to almost any virus, you know, um, and you find through the specific ones. Yeah, and I mean, we live in, a, in a, an amazing sea of viruses that people do not realize. But every day, on every square yard of this planet, something like 875 million viruses descend. Uh, that's a lot of viruses on a square yard. <laughs> Yeah, our 865 world. million of them are, are, are completely harmless. It's <laughs> it's that odd million. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, that's actually very true. It's, yeah, mo most of those we don't care about. Or some of them are actually incredibly valuable to us, probably because they, they stop other ones or they uh, turn out to be doing good things for us. But yeah, we sure, do it's like the bacteria in your gut. Right. You know, that, that you need them. You can't survive without them. Absolutely. On the other hand, if you could make a, a biochemical test. A smell test on what's in your gut. We know how to find out what what smells in your gut. Then, then you can see uh, how that bacteria is functioning and whether it's functioning properly. And you can identify, you know, uh, antigens that way um, just from the smell of what's in your gut. There's a huge interest these days in in sort of called microbiomics. You know, looking looking at the the massive populations of stuff that lives in your guts yeah and they turn out to be doing a lot a lot a lot of important stuff uh that, that we had not even begun to suspect they are related to things as diverse as mental conditions like depression um as well as much more common sort of gut associated things like ulcers and, and all that uh that kind of issue um and again as we get better and better, we're going to be able to start fine tuning that, that microbial population. And uh, you, you need a little more of this species and a little fewer of these. So we're going to send in a specific, you know, bacterial or viral trap that will take out one population while extra dosing you with the other and we'll, we'll readjust your whole microbiome up to fine tune it, you know? Yeah. And if I, if I were, if I were a scientist and I could, live anywhere in the world, I could read up on this, I could talk to my collaborators anywhere, and I could work on, on that theory, and the theories of all of these, you know, innovations you've been talking about from Israel. Um, so I think it's, it's a global process, and in a few years, we're going to see people from every corner of the earth participating. A good, a good bet also, by the way, would be India, because there's, you know, so much research going on in India. And P.S. They have their own vaccine, which they are altruistically giving or selling cheap to developing countries, and they're right. doing a yeoman's job in in containing the virus, even where the United States is, is not, you know, uh, helping. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, what else you got? Let's 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 see some more of these. I'm interested so, in making notes, you know, and this is all going to be in the final exam, you guys. <laughs> So another thing is that they've apparently refined the techniques of uh, so-called deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation has, has been recognized as a very powerful thing, but the problem is that it's extremely delicate and extremely invasive. You have to go in and you know drill a hole in the skull and slide an electrode deep in somebody's brain and hoping you're only hitting just get to just the right spot and then crank on the current. They've apparently now developed ways of doing that with from the surface. So you don't have to go deep anymore, but you can still control right where the stimulation occurs without being invasive. So again, a lot of people haven't heard of deep brain stimulation. It's not as well appreciated, but, but it's an extraordinarily powerful technique for a lot of neurological diseases. Parkinson's is, is the classic one where we know there's a location that basically your brain has sort of gone bad, you know, sort of what's happened, the neurons have gotten screwed up sort of, again, almost a plaque-like issue. And, and now if you can treat this from the outside, uh, you know, again, it, it just, it, it opens up the doorways to treating many, many more patients, you know, and, and offering it to, to a much broader audience, you know. Well, it's, it's, again, it's the uh, non-invasive, 
And I think it opens up a whole new area of technology that is reaching inside with electromagnetic waves somehow and focusing that. It's not X-rays, something else, and 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 having a um, a result. I mean, achieving a desired result without touching anybody. Uh, and I think that you know that's what happens. Uh, you know, one, I, I read recently about um, a situation where there was some very sensitive material on a, a, a computer drive, and they were very concerned that um, that the adversary. This is a true story. This is not fiction. Uh, the adversary would would be able to modify the computer drive right through the wall of a room, and all they had to do was focus some kind of electromagnetic. Right? You know. You, it's a weapon, you know, you've heard of this. <clears throat> and, and thus they would be able to change or destroy the data on, on the drive. So in order to protect the drive, they put it in a room which, which was lead lined or something, which would resist this kind of electromagnetic thing. But it points out that this is a technology that's pretty well advanced. You can affect things through a wall, certainly sure. through, through, through the bones in your head with electronic you know, signals. And I think there'll be more of that. It's also in a Star Trek. Yeah, I, I think the, the real take home message to me in, in reading through this stuff though, and I, I'm so glad you shared those, those things with me, Jay, because it was really inspiration to read about them. And it speaks to me about a culture of science in, in Israel. And that there is a culture of science that says, science is here to serve humankind. Science is here to, to do good for people. And like, let's focus our energy on, on that idea. On, Putting out science that's going to help the world, you know, that is going to make uh, medicine more accessible, medicine more effective, you know, going to make it easier, cheaper uh, to do things that are currently need to be done but can't be done, or, or it takes a lot of technology and a lot of help to do them. And that, that kind of culture is so invaluable. Um, you know, it, it really. It's, it's very different from, for instance, the Chinese system where the, <clears throat> the party gets to determine what science happens and, and runs it in the US system, which is very open and <clears throat> everyone does whatever science they want pretty much. Uh, somehow there's, there's a, a culture in the, among Israeli scientists must be, well, let, let's, let's see who, who can do the best thing for humanity. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was telling you about, <clears throat> this is, Back in the, uh, I want to say the 80s, uh, it was the time of uh, Idi Amin's adventure uh, at the airport in uh, Uganda, where he you know, took a plane load of people. Uh, I think it was an El Al flight uh, hostage. And uh, the Israelis came down there and did a surprise raid and, re and rescued all of them. They, they, they would have been in great trouble if, had the Israelis not rescued them. And um, <clears throat> The Jewish community here in Honolulu invited one of the people on that plane, on the, the C-130 that rescued him. Uh, there were two C-130s, as I recall, um, to come here. And he was a doctor. And I remember he spoke at the Pacific Club, and I was in the room. And one thing he said that struck me was, you know, you, you, know, you, you have to understand the difference between an Israeli doctor and a medical doctor in the U.S. Nobody worships us. We, we, we don't make all that much money. We're, we're trades people. We, we just do our job. We save lives. <clears throat> and we, we occupy a different space in the society. I'm just a doctor. That's, that's what I am. I, I save lives. I, I don't intend to make a lot of money or live in a big house. I'm just a doctor. <clears throat> and I thought that was really interesting because this guy was, in fact, he saved some lives in that, in that raid. And he was, um, he was a doctor. Uh, who was called into service, you know, uh, for military service in order to go on the, the, the raid. Suffice to say, I think this, it's instructive, you know, to remember that, my experience, um, and to, you know, and to compare that with the scientists in, in Israel. It's, I'm just yeah. a scientist. I, I do this right. to save lives. Right. I do this to invent new things for the benefit of the world. I'm right. not, not going to rule the world. I'm not going to make a million billion. This is just what I do. It's what, I do. what my science is supposed to do is make humanity a lot better. You know, basically that, that's why we why we ask these questions, why we develop the technologies is, is to to make make humankind better off. You know, and and they're doing an incredible job of it. You know, that's but, the gratification, but, really. Yeah. 
and, and they and they have developed some very good schools and scientific centers right. you know in, in a relatively small geographical area they have a lot of schools and research facilities uh, well, I, I would you know uh, uh, this is something we should follow don't you think because it's coming out of there and the question is uh, i don't know if we have a handle on this the question is all these inventions i, I know we haven't come to the end of your list yet but um how do these things get into the mainstream? If I say, well, yeah, I want to try that you know, nasal spray. I want, I want to take that blood test. Um, I, want to, I want to find out if I have uh, you know, lung cancer. I want to breathe into a tube. Do I have to travel to Israel? That's, you know, that's a long way. Um, yeah. How is that going to get into the mainstream in the United States? That's... Yeah, you know, that's one of the issues. Not, not, these technologies are all at sort of different stages of, of development. I'm sure that again, they they run them, uh, you know, have some approval process before they can be even used experimentally. Sure. Uh, and then, you know, once they pass that experimental stage and prove not to be harm planned to be helpful, they'll, you know, make them they'll, they'll distribute them more broadly. Presumably, a lot of these things, they will then basically turn around and, and tell the rest of the world, hey, here's how to make this. You know, you guys go take it, test it yourselves, you know, play with it any way you want and, and put, it, put it to use. You know, um, they, they, may, they may want to get some compensation for it, which is richly deserved, of course, you know, sure. to make back your development costs and all. But, um, yeah. Um, what, what I get out of this discussion, Ethan, is that is that you know maybe the maybe COVID has sensitized us to the uh, speed at which remarkable drugs can be developed, a vaccine, for example. But now also the therapeutics. The thera I mean, wow, the therapeutics are coming on. We we were delayed in that. We were so focused on the vaccines, we weren't really concentrating on the on the right. therapeutics. But there is. Three or four or half a dozen therapeutics now that are remarkable, not only from this country either. Right. So it, it just it it shows you that there's a extraordinary future out there for us. And if we concentrate on it, if we work together on it, if we don't get hung up in politics and bureaucracy, we can mm -hmm. all have the benefits of these remarkable drugs and, and live longer and a better quality of life. It's right out there. We can see it and touch it, don't you think? It's, it it's a likable science, you know, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, Ethan. <laughs> and if you guys are interested in likable science, go on thinktechaway.com or youtube.com slash thinktechaway and look up the, the playlist called likable science. And you will see Ethan there hundreds of times on all kinds of scientific developments around the world. Thank you so much, Ethan. It's great to talk to you as always. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for putting me on that stuff. And thanks for having me on so we could talk about it. I enjoyed it. We'll do it again. Take care. Right. Aloha.